If you have your Bibles, if you would, just meet me in um, the book of Ephesians, Ephesians, the sixth chapter, Ephesians, <clears throat> Ephesians, the sixth chapter. I want to revisit some things I've touched on before, but I want to um, give this to you in season. I don't believe that there's a time where this is more fitting than now and you know, we've launched our uh, new service time, so this is 10.30. Thank you for making the adjustment. The early service is 8.30. Um, and uh, I tend to, when I launch new services, to, to do, you know, historically I've done more user-friendly stuff. You know, things that, you know, your, your visitors and friends would, would res resonate with them. Things that are extremely practical and broad for whoever may find themselves uh, here. Uh, when there are launch, there's launching of new services, times. Um, but that's not what I have uh, for you today. I have something that I believe is necessary, and I tried to keep this until next week, but I, I just, it reverberated in my spirit and everything else I, I looked at and prepared for. I, I just couldn't do it. I believe with all my heart, <clears throat> this is, for some of you, this is both um, globally but also personally and sometimes there's a difference. Other times, at every layer of our human journey, uh, it's true. And I believe with all my heart, and you'll, some of you will identify it once we go into the Word, but I believe we're in one of the most pronounced season of spiritual warfare. And I don't say that to uh, dampen your mood or anything like that. I don't think we should run from it, but we should understand the nature of it and understand how to make a distinction distinction in between just happenstance in life and what is is undoubtedly rooted in spiritual reality and i want to help you parse through that a little bit today but also if we get to it i want to have a time of prayer for some people that walked in this place and you've been in the midst of spiritual warfare also, I'm going to pray for some people that walked in this place and have no clue as it relates to what you've been going through. By the time we finish, you will. And I'm going to pray for you too. Uh, let me change that. I'm going to pray for us. <laughs> you know, I remember, I remember studying this, you know, the, you know, in the Old Testament in particular, the priest would extend blessing. And I always ask myself the question, well, if the priest is praying for everybody, and extending blessing. Who's blessing the priest? Who's blessing the one that is the vessel that is extending the blessing of God? And it's beautiful. As you look into it, you'll find that as you're blessing the people, as the priest blessed the people, the blessing was also spoken over their life. And so I never want to stand in a position as if I've arrived and this is for y'all. This is for us. Can I get an amen on that? <laughs> Ephesians, the sixth chapter, beginning at the 10th verse, a familiar passage for the subject matter that we've begun. And it reads, Finally, my brethren and sisterin, that's the Wayne Cheney translation, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. Right before you take your seats, if you would look at no less than five people and tell them we're reviewing the tape today. Tell them we're That's five. Sit down. <laughs> I think it's important for us to observe 
every dimension of God's counsel for our effective living and ministry, every bit of God's divine counsel is, is necessary. The Bible says, those who come to God must believe that he is and is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. And so it's important to, to note that if God is real, and God is, then what God says is real, and everything contained in God's word as it relates to what God declares over our life is real. And so if God is real, which I believe many of us, or not most of us in this, this room are convinced of, and everything that God tells us about, everything that his word war warns us about, I think should be considered, not only considered, but adopted as, as divine truth. The reason I say this is because many of us have no issue worshiping the Lord and giving testimonies of the goodness of the Lord. But some of us wrestle with the reality of what the Bible says exists, and that is that which opposes the will of God. If God is real, then also the enemy is real. The Lord is real. The devil is real. And it does not glorify the enemy to bring our attention to the fact that not only what opposes God's will is real, but the adversary who opposes us to prevent God's will is also real. It's interesting to note that there are Christians, believers. I was in a, a class, one of my cohorts at Duke, and you know, I wrote in a paper uh, some of what I'm going to begin to explain now. And as I wrote it, my, my classmate would read it and review it, and he reviewed it and said, well, in my context, we, we don't really talk about the enemy. And I understand that. We don't glorify, we don't fix our, our minds on opposition to the will of God or the adversary, but it is important to note that the Bible from Genesis to Revelation paints the picture of um, our adversary being real, not make-believe, not a figment of our imagination, not mind over matter, but outside of our own person, outside of our own being, outside of our own will, there is at work opposition to the will of God and often opposition to the will of God exercised through us. And if we believe in God, we've got to take in the full counsel of God's word so that we'll know how to navigate this reality. You cannot cure what you don't diagnose. And you cannot diagnose what you refuse to believe exists. And so, please forgive me, I know this is not the user-friendly, seeker-sensitive message, uh, and I hope the church still grows, <laughs> but, but, but somebody has got to say something about the turbulence that we find ourselves in, and, and, and we find ourselves here because as we seek to advance or expand the, the, the territory and expansion of territory is not simply land being taken or money being given. All those can be tools to expand the actual territory. And here's a little nugget, if I can speak parenthetically, about those who criticize the Bible and critique the Bible as if it's a book of war, that, promoting war. Now, there are people that came with false or inaccurate interpretation and did not understand the emphasis of the Lord as it relates to some of those things and use the Bible or weaponize the Bible to create war, to, to pillage, to, to crusade. There are people who took that and co-opted it. But please understand, everything we see in the Old Testament, I believe, was pointing to New Testament realities. It was not about simply taking physical land and, and, and driving people out of physical land. It was to point to the true and most valuable land. 
The most valuable land, as you've heard me say before, is not Champs-Élysées. The most valuable land is not uh, Homby Hills. The most valuable land is not Park Avenue. But the most valuable uh, land, I will help you identify this real quick. Just touch yourself. Touch yourself right now. Uh, you just laid hands on the most valuable land in all of the universe. Are you still here with me? Heaven and hell fight over this real estate. Angels and demons fight over this real estate. Satan plots and plans over this real estate. Generational influences are brokered over this real estate. The most precious blood in all of the universe throughout human history was spilled to save this real estate. Please understand that the most valuable real estate in all of the world, look at your neighbor, tell them you're sitting right next to it. You're sitting, yeah. And so when we read these, these, these narratives in the Old Testament that push us to, to drive out the enemy from the land or to not allow anything to live, there, these are lessons for how to manage our person and to ensure that there is a greater influence of the king in his kingdom in our life than it is the invading armies of the enemy, the influencing thoughts, the influencing philosophies, the, the limiting or sabotaging cycles that come into our life, the, the dashing temptations that take us out of the will of God, the distractions that keep us confused. It is a lesson not on how to go to war against literal people, but it's a lesson on how to take this most valuable territory. And if we're to take this most valuable territory, we can't allow ungodly influences to dwell in the same place that the people of God or the influence of God dwells. The greatest stronghold is not a plot of land, but the greatest stronghold is the soul of an individual. That is what we're fighting for. And whenever you have made it your will to not only fight for that reality in yourself, but to bring others into that reality, you have just stepped into the advancement of the kingdom of God. Because every time they talk to you, some stronghold that the enemy had them fixed in is being displaced. Some sabotaging cycle that they were tangled up in is being evicted. Are you still here with me? Your mere presence alone, your difference, the mere fact that you don't laugh at everything everybody else is laughing at creates a standard when you walk into a room. Please understand that the greatest war is happening over the soul, your soul, and the souls of individuals for who is going to have the greatest influence. And if you have decided that it's going to be Christ and his kingdom, and if you have decided that you're going to make that your work no matter what your profession is, you can expect opposition. You can expect warfare. I don't know anybody who doesn't, who gladly goes along with the eviction process. <laughs> Help me, y'all. Even good people that know they hadn't paid for a year will try to stretch that bad boy out until the sheriff shows up. <laughs> so you have to understand that we not only wrestle not against flesh and blood, we have an adversary the Bible lets us know about, but beyond that, we have an adversary who does not like being evicted from people's lives that he had strongholds in. Because in order to gain authority and in order to wreak havoc on the in this natural and adorning world, on this earth in which we live, you have to have the influence of people. 
because everything in this life either is owned by or is under the influence of a person somewhere. So if I have influence over the individual, I have influence in the world. And the enemy's goal is to manifest his influence in the world through people as God is seeking to manifest his glory in the world through people. That is why the Bible says all creation groans waiting for something, waiting for the sons and the daughters of God to be revealed. It doesn't just say saved, it says revealed. Because there are a whole lot of us in here saved, but baby, what we're waiting on is for you to be revealed. You're revealed when you start talking like him. You're revealed when you start thinking like him. You're revealed when you can push the temptations to the periphery. You can push the distractions to the periphery and say, this one thing do I do. We are saved, but God is waiting for us to be revealed. And so as there's this tension, there's warfare. Uh, hmm, let me see how I can put this way. Mob Deep was right. Oh, okay, I got it. <laughs> um, it says a war going outside. No man is safe from. You can run, but you can't hide. For, okay, I forgot. This is, okay, I gotta, I'm coming up with a Snoop one next time. I just couldn't think of one in time. This is West Coast. I get it. Th there's a real battle going on. A legitimate battle going on that we must be aware of. In Ephesians 6, the writer says there, we wrestle not against flesh and blood. He says, but against powers, against principalities, against, he says, spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. But as we read this, we often emphasize the armor but ignore the why. We can get to the armor and, and girding yourself of the armor of God, but we must observe the why. Say why. why? Um, and I want to make sure we understand. Thanks for asking me. Because I want to make sure you, we understand the assignment. We'll go through the armor another day, but I want to zero in on this because here's my, what I suspect. The warfare in the world, but also in your household, is thick right now. Uh, the enemy's on the loose and going crazy, y'all. He, he, he's tripping. And it's not only on the global stage, but if truth be told, it's in your household. And I want to make sure, or in your life, I want to make sure that we're soberly aware of how to parse this out so we know how to diagnose the issue and to deal with the adversary because we are not ignorant of the enemy's schemes. He he, he, he reveals that the goal of this, the reason that we're to put on the full armor of God, here it is, is so that we can, here it is, so that we can stand. I right, sleep on this side. Let me see if I got some party people over here. He, he says the goal of us putting on all the war warfare, he says a whole lot going on, y'all. People would lead you to believe, you know, that this is just mind over matter. This is just a general trial. Everybody goes through something. Yeah, they do go through something. But this is why I believe the Bible calls us more than conquerors. I never understood either you're a conqueror or not. You overcome something or not. You're a winner or a loser. You, <laughs> I don't understand how you can be a more than winner. Like, have you ever thought about that? Listen, in a boxing match, you are a winner or a loser. In a foot race, you are a winner or a loser. In, in a pop locking contest, you are a winner or a loser. But it says that we are more than conquerors. How can we be more than conquerors? I realize, he says stand twice. I believe with all my heart we are more than conquerors because we got some more than problems. We have the stuff that everybody else is going through, but in addition to what everybody else is going through, we also have an adversary that's at work in the earth in an attempt to try to prevent the expansion of God's kingdom in the hearts and the lives of individuals who is attempting to diminish God's glory in the earth 
by moving people that love the Lord into disobedience so that the fullness of God's glory cannot be seen through them. Yes, we lose jobs. Yes, we get sick. Yes, we break up with our girlfriends and boyfriends, but that's what everybody goes through. We have are more than conquerors because we have some more than problems. We have all that and spiritual opposition through the life of people that oppose what God is desiring to do in us. That is why God couldn't just make us conquerors. There are natural conquerors. He says, I've got to give you victory over natural circumstance and spiritual opposition. So I can't use the same definition for you. You're not just a conqueror. You're a more than. God, I feel like y'all, y'all t- touch your neighbor real quick. Tell them I- I'm a more than conqueror. I- I'm not complaining about my more than problems. I was built for this. I was built to overcome. I, I was built. I was built to go through the same struggles you go through, but also know that the weapons of my warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God for the pulling. I don't know who I'm talking to, but before this thing is said or done, we're going to pull down some strongholds. We're not just going to employ good strategy and mind over matter. No, I'm going to invoke what I can't do in my natural self. I'm going to call on the name of the Lord and watch darkness skip. Forgive me, but I... I can tell who's really been going through it. As a matter of fact, I can't wait for the rest of the message. I need somebody to lift up your voice and take authority over it right now. Remind yourself that your weapons are greater than everybody else's. I'm sorry, I'm not being user friendly today. Forgive me. Somebody next to you will explain what's going on. I didn't come just for a message. I came to pull down some strongholds. I came to uproot some plots of the enemy. I, I came. Hold on, hold on. He says, the reason, here we go, is so that we can stand. Stand. Stand for what? He says, stand through the schemes. Ooh. Stand through the schemes of the enemy. Another trailer says, the wiles, stand through the wiles of the devil. Because, y'all, the devil be wilding. He is. Help me. Is it just me or has the enemy been wild? I'm going to try to get on with my message. We're going to tell you what to do against the wiles of the enemy. But just let me say this real quick before we move on. Um, If the devil is wilding, that's a good sign for you. It means you are advancing God's kingdom. Because in this hour, if there ain't no beef, We're right in the middle of the war. If you ain't feeling it in this hour, you may want to check which direction you're going in. You may want to check your compass. Because my grandfather used to say, if you have not brushed up against the devil in a while, it's probably because you're going in the same direction. But when you, when you bout face, and take your stand, you must understand that there's going to be some smoke, y'all. But look at your neighbor, tell him, I was built for this. I'm not looking for a fight. I don't want to fight. I don't want any more drama in my life. Like Mary said, I don't want no more drama, no more drama in my life. But in the event that I have to roll up my sleeves, please understand, I was, I was built for this. Look at your neighbor and say, I know how to do it. I know. I know how to fast. I, I know how to pray. I, I know how to not eat for 20 days and, until the breakthrough comes. I know how to do this. <laughs> yeah. The reason, he says, is so that we may, here it is, stand. 
key word of the passage, Mole puts it uh, this way. The, the present picture of, of, of standing in this context is not a march, it's not an assault, but it is, here it is, it is standing, what it is, it's holding. It's, it's holding, it's the picture of holding a fortress, holding a fortress, holding, it's the picture of, if you've ever seen the war, where they say, hold the line. It's a picture of holding the line, holding the fortress. It is not an attack, but he says there are times where the warfare and the opposition against the believer who's advancing God's kingdom is atmospheric. And he said in those moments, here's the picture. He said you are to, to stand. You are to hold the line. Holding, here it is, the fortress of your soul. And if you open up your eyes, there, we're losing the ability in many respects to hold the fortress of our soul. To hold on to our conviction. Conviction about who God is. In the face of people saying who God is and God is in holding the fortress of the soul, even though we are wrestling, we're struggling to hold it all together. No one does this perfectly. We are all in the struggle. But as we are in the struggle, as we are wrestling, what we're not going to wrestle about is what God says being right. I'm not going to change God's standard to try to meet my agenda. I've got to say, looking at God's standard, even if I haven't made it yet, I'm on my way. Because in order to do that, though, you've got to hold, you have to stand and hold the fortress, here it is, of your soul against competing arguments and degrading philosophies and temporary distractions. He says, I want you to stand in the midst of everything the enemy is throwing your way. He said, hold the fortress of your soul because unless you're anchored, you can't help hold anybody else down. He said, hold the fortress of your soul and as you're anchored, you're checking on those on your left and on your right saying, we got this, right? Remember what the Lord said. I, I see you drifting because of that philosophy or teaching. And I know this is not popular anymore, but we got to anchor ourselves because the only way we're going to be able to do battle, the only way we're going to be able to advance the kingdom is if we stand and hold the fortress of our soul. He says, stand. He says, stand holding the fortress of the soul in the, the church for the heavenly king. He says, stand, focus. The focus is to stand, to stand guard against what, here it is, deteriorates the conviction of your soul. I don't know about y'all, I don't see too many uh, ride or die folks in the battle anymore. Uh, maybe they are. It's just, it's just a little bit more quiet. Uh, you know, if you, I get it. There are times where there's deep conviction, but listen, there are other times there's not deep conviction, but if there's not deep conviction, at least there should be some wrestling. I, I want to feel. We can make mistakes. There can be frailty to err as human, but the reality is he, even in error, I want to see something in you. I'm scared of anybody who is not at least wrestling in the tension of being pulled but still trying to hold on to God. I'm scared of anybody who is not in the tension of, of trying to at least stay anchored while the winds of doctrine are blowing and the winds of temptation are blowing and the winds of popular opinion are, are blowing. M most of us as believers just blow right along. With it, we're carried just like a current. We're, we're playing in the water and we look up because of the subtlety of the current. We look around and we're nowhere near where we camped out because there is a drift. He said in the middle of the drift, our assignment is to bring us back to center. He says in the middle of the drift, we cannot give up warfare, the fight to keep the conviction of our soul intact while everybody else is just doing them. Have you noticed how 
uh, the statement right before the fall is always, I got this, <laughs> or I'm doing me. Now, let me ask you this question. Really, me this. Uh, has anybody ever observed someone who takes the posture that I'm doing me in this season, ending up better in the next season? <laughs> I haven't. <laughs> in fact, whenever I said I'm doing me this season, it was a demotion the next season. I don't know about y'all. It wasn't. If you're righteous, listen, there are seasons where it, I'm doing me. You can always tell the people who God's hands really on, because the next season, like, I'm cool on doing me. I don't want to do me no more. I don't trust me to go out. I don't trust me to talk to you. I don't trust me with the money. I don't trust me with the influence. I don't trust me with the promotion that I hustled to get. Are you still here with me? Anybody who's ever said I'm doing me the next season if God's hands on your life is, I don't want to do me no more. There is, there are times where I go from my standing to the tension of wrestling. But look at your neighbor telling me it ought to be something. Yeah. Let me ask this question. Um, are you still standing? All right, now, let me. Um, all right, if you're not standing, uh, at least, at least, help a brother out. Are you wrestling? <laughs> all right, let's see how honest you are. They got honest. Most churches aren't honest. That's what I love about Antioch. Y'all real. Like standing. Uh, <laughs> wrestling. Yeah. Now let's see if you're really honest. Who's doing them in this season right now? <laughs> There's still hope. There's still hope. He said, listen. He said that we are to stand first use of this word is in this verse, and it is in many respects a compound word, this idea of standing, a compound verb that actually means to withstand. And thestinia, it means, it means to, to withstand. It means to stand, implying that you're standing against great opposition. And let me say this, people of God, if nowhere else, I want Antioch to have a conviction. Whether you're standing, whether you're wrestling, just do not let go. Because I'm telling you, the manifestation of those who have refused to stand is getting ready to be revealed in the next season. Listen, y'all, the enemy is wilding. And if there's ever a time where you stand, it's right now. If there's ever a time where there's less slack in the rope is right now. Can I get prophetic real quick? This is why God is beginning to expose and remove all sorts of things that are not in alignment to him right now. And you're trying to trace it and trying to figure it out, but God is getting you right. He's not allowing you to get away with the foolishness. You got away with this time last year. Why? Because he's getting serious about what is next. That is this hour. He's not going to let anybody stay there and derail you or detour you in this hour, but there will be radical shaking. Are you still here with me? And it is not to kill you, but it is to bring you back to the path. It is not to kill you, but it is to take you off of your knees and to put you back in a position where you're standing once again, where you're holding on to the conviction, where you say, I may not be advancing right now. Don't worry if you're advancing Listen, listen to me. I need to know if you're standing because if you can stand after what's about to blow over, you will accelerate in the near future. I don't care how far or how fast you're going. I just need some people to stand. It is. I will make some sense of what you've been experiencing. This, 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 this verb so now I, in, it is, it is, it is implying a stand against great opposition, but not only a stand against great opposition, it's more accurate than this, than that. Here it is. It is to stand face to face. 
face to face against something. All right. I'm glad you're standing. Uh, what are you standing face to face against? Because uh, in this day and age, um, I don't know if anybody is standing against anything. All right, thank you. That one clap. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? Your, your common thoughts. When I say to stand against, I'm talking about the philosophies and the theologies and the mindset that are widely held by the masses that are bought into systematic modes of thought that he says, Paul tells Timothy, there are doctrines of demons, systematic modes of thought that are widely adopted, celebrated, regurgitated, and, impl and, and implemented that if you Trace them to their roots, he says, they're rooted in demonic origin. Yeah. What philosophies, what mindsets are competing against the very movement of God in the earth and the glory of God in the life of people are you finding agreement with versus standing Opposed to. Yeah, it should get quiet. That's a thinking moment. Oh, let's answer that question. You, sir. Um, no, I'm not going to do it. <laughs> it is to stand face to face. It's a dual word. Here it is. Second part of that word means it's the picture of. I love this. This would not make sense logically in terms of its progression unless it was God. There are things that make sense in its progression because God upsets the order and can do two things at once. This word is a picture of standing in opposition or with your face against something face to face, but it is simultaneously revealed as a word that means to stand after the fight or the wrestling is over as a victor in the competition. So the idea is that you're standing against the influences of the enemy, but you are also, as you're standing in the battle, before the battle is over, you're standing in victory. Only God can have you in the middle of the battle standing against the hell that is coming your way. And as you're standing against the hell that is coming your way, you're standing in opposition, trying to hold the fortitude of your conviction while simultaneously understanding that I stand in victory, that anything that has come against me as I'm carrying out the will of God has not come against a mere mortal. But anything that comes against me as I'm advancing the kingdom of the Lord and seeking to glorify the Lord, to stand against me is not mere human effort, but to, my mere human effort, but to stand against me is to stand against the host of heaven as God's agenda is moving forward through me. That is why I said in the Judas message, you can have disloyalty. You can have people fighting against you, but you've got to leave room for God. Because when you're in God's will and you stand, it is a stance of opposition, but it's also a posture of victory. When, when you're standing for the Lord, you always stand in victory. Has anybody noticed that you're insecure when you're outside of God's will with everything that comes your way? But when you're in God's will, 
and you're standing with all hell breaking loose around you. You don't know how it's going to come. You don't know when it's going to come. You don't know what God, God's going to do, but you stand in full confidence knowing come hell or high water, I'm in the will of the Lord. And even before, I don't know how it's, there's going to be a victory. I just know there is going to be a victory. But even before there is a victory, matter of fact, even before I know how God's going to secure the victory, I have the confidence of victory because my God is reliable enough to hold all things together even when I cannot see my way. I'm walking into the storm, but I have a sense of victory in the storm. Why? Because I'm standing opposed to opposition, which means I'm in alignment to God. And if I'm in alignment to God, my stance is a stance of victory. I tell somebody, tell them, uh, you're in victory even in the struggle. Now, now can, I, can I just give you my little lesson? Because I haven't got to the lesson yet. <laughs> but it's going to be a short one. Because I want you to come back next week. Uh, but notice this. Um, the Bible says, we'll get to the full armor of God. But it says, y'all, we stand. Why? We're standing against the schemes you scheme. We stand against the wiles of the devil. All right, I told you before, uh, devil be wilding. And right now, enemy, he's tripping. But God sent me in this place to ensure that we're fortified. Because he said, I'm not ignorant of his schemes, which means in order to stand, in order to pre prepare for what you're facing, in order to have victory in what you're facing, you must understand your opponent. Real quick, can we roll the game footage real quick? Um, like any fight, you need to review your opponent. And the greatest snapshot of your opponent is not in this passage. This passage shows us Number one, that there's some stuff beyond what is in this natural and adorning world that comes against us. It may come in the form of a person, not even a wretched person or a wretched person, depending on generation. It may come through a good person who is in a usable space. And just for the record, we all, at some point, are in a usable space, super saint. <laughs> Look at your neighbor. Tell them you've been in a usable space yourself. <laughs> I'm not calling you demon possessed. <laughs> but you've been in a usable space. Uh, you have to acknowledge that, because when, when I say this, you, know, you start thinking about the person who got on your last nerve, like, oh, the devil always uses them. <laughs> no. No, no. We have all been in a usable space. And the enemy, when we're moving forward into our destiny and purpose, will often, if he can not get to us because we're fortified, he'll often find those who are in a usable space. Come, come here, Peter. Uh, who do men say that I am? Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Wow, Peter, that's some good revelation. Flesh and blood did not reveal that to you, but it was my Father from heaven which revealed that to you. And I say, uh, your name is Peter. I'm going to rename you. And on this rock, I build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Peter was like, yeah, I got that right. All the other apostles or disciples were jealous. Peter was feeling himself. And in feeling himself, a, little, a few lines down, he started talking again. He said, I'm doing good on these odds. That first revelation was good. Let me try another one. Jesus was talking about going to the cross to secure our salvation and to deliver us from sin. And as Jesus is talking about going to the cross, Peter says, I'll never let you go to the cross. I, I'm not going to let anybody put their hands on you. Jesus swivels around. <laughs> he looks at Peter. Now, there's some Rick James cold blood. I mean, talk about cold blooded. <laughs> he looks at him and says, he doesn't even work up to it. He says, get behind me, Satan. <laughs> Wait, this is just the man 
who gave revelation from on high. Few lines down, he says, I've discerned that you are in a usable space. I'm not saying you're demon possessed. I'm not saying you're rocking with the devil. In fact, you rocking with me. You're on my side. But even people rocking with me can be in a usable space sometimes. What makes it a usable space? It's a usable space when what comes out of your mouth or person hinders the purposes of God in my life. And in those moments, I've, I've got to file it down. I've been in the usable space. You've been in the usable space. We've all been in, all God's children have been in a usable space. But how do we discern what is true spiritual warfare? How do we sniff it out? How do we discern it? There's some people in here like me whose discernment, who skew high on discernment as a spiritual gift. Um, uh, for me, I, I could usually smell it on a person before it happens to me. Uh, I usually get a memo, a check in my spirit before there's ever uh, a manifested offense uh, in the real world. Um, but, 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 but it doesn't happen like that for everyone. There, there is something to the peace level and discerning of spirits. But, but in a general sense, we find a snapshot of how to do this and how to discern the difference. Because in this season, we're going to have to discern the difference in between what is just happenstance and what is actually spiritual warfare. And here's the lesson I'm going to give you in eight minutes. Who'll give me eight minutes? All right, eight, 16. Yeah, I, I, I'm gonna be here all day. I'm gonna be here all day. Here is how you discern it. All right, here we go, number one. Let's travel back to Jesus. Jesus is baptized. He's led by the Spirit into the wilderness. He fasts for 40 days. And in Luke 4, it tells us after the 40 days were up, Satan comes to tempt him with everything we can be tempted with. He tempted him with the lust of the flesh. Every category of temptation we can be tempted with, Jesus was tempted with on one in one setting. The category number one, the lust of the flesh. He said, turn these stones into bread. Jesus said, man shall not live on bread alone. Then number two, he said, look at the kingdoms of the world. If you just bow down to me, just a brief compromise, he said, I will give you all that your eye can see. That is the lust of the eyes. He said, if you just compromise real quick, listen, here, here, here's the hustle. Y'all, here's the hustle that we're still falling for. The enemy says, if you can just real quick, just bow down to me real quick, I'll give you everything that your eye could see, I'll give you everything that your eye wants, and I'll give you ultimately what God was going to give you sooner than God had it for you. Because God's goal was to release all the kingdoms of heaven and earth to him as he stood in authority through death, burial, resurrection. But the enemy says you don't have to go through the pain, the work, or take the time in order to get what God has for you. If you just compromise real quick, I'll release to you what God has for you through compromise. And the hustle for most is, oh, then I'll flip it and use it for God or God's glory and for righteous purposes. Jesus said, sorry, I cannot bow down to you and compromise what I believe to get a quick fix and an acceleration to what God ultimately has for me. Because if I take from you temporarily through compromise what God ultimately had for me as I stand in my conviction, you can take it back from me. I can lose what's there. I can watch the fabric of my fortitude unravel. But if I do the hard thing and do this the way that God wants me to do it, when I get there, if God gives it, can't nobody take it away. He said, just do it real quick. Jesus said, no, I ain't going to do that. Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. He said, then he took him to the high place in the, of the temple. And he says, if you just jump down, he'll catch you. The lust of the eye of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, here it is, the pride of life. If you make it about your purposes, if you make this surround you as opposed to God, listen, It'll pull you out of God's will. He said, if you jump, listen, the Lord will catch you. Jesus said, the Lord does not like to be put to the test. In other words, it's not about me. It's about 
him. My God, I wish he could say this in this narcissistic culture. It is not about me, he says. It is about him. And I'm not going to manipulate God to do magic tricks to, to, because I, I choose to have him do that. I am here for his purposes. He was tempted with the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. Here we go. And he stood. He, he maintained his conviction. He stood his ground. He held the fortress of his soul. And the reason he was able to hold, to anchor our souls is because he held the fortress of his soul. Why am I here? Because in this crazy, this crazy world, with legit spiritual warfare, with solicitation outside to get out of the will of God, I'm here to remind you that you can still stand, but in order to stand, you've got to be able to identify it. Number one, here it is. When does the enemy come? He comes at a time, how do you know a spiritual warfare versus everything else? He comes at a time when you often are vulnerable. The Bible said that he had fasted 40 days, 40 nights, and after the time of fasting was over, he was hungry, he was worn down, his physical person was likely depleted. And in that moment when he is naturally worn down, the enemy says, this is an opportune time to tempt and to capitalize on his frailty. But here's why it's so difficult for us to discern spiritual warfare from natural circumstance because often the enemy comes and amplifies spiritual warfare while you're in difficult natural circumstance. And so as things begin to spiral, you look at the record and say, it's just because I'm hungry, it's just because I'm tired, it's just because I've lost my girlfriend, my boyfriend, it's just because Bunny's funny, it's just because I lost my job. And you dismiss the spiritual warfare and you cannot stand against or cure what you do not diagnose. And so because you think it's natural, you try to give natural remedies to address spiritual matters. You need some rest and relaxation, but you also need time of communion with God and prayer because often the enemy comes when you are most vulnerable. You can't just dismiss it as natural circumstance. Number two, you know a spiritual warfare when it is consecutive. Note that the enemy did not come this time and hit him with the lust of the flesh and then wait six months to hit him with the lust of the eyes and wait another two years to hit him with the pride of life. You know that it is consolidated spiritual warfare. Follow me, y'all when it is consecutive, like the waves, like a rip tide at the beach. You stand up to your feet and are knocked down by the waves and you finally get another breath and you're knocked down by the wave again when it's consecutive, back to back to back to back. That's how you know. Thanks, Drake. That, that's how you know. It's spiritual warfare when it's, look at your neighbor, tell them back to back. Yeah. I know that's carnal for some of you, but that's a mnemonic device. It's a hip-hop mnemonic device to get them to remember when to know that the enemy is attacking. You can discern when it's spiritual warfare, when, when it's back to back. He gets hit with one wave, the lust of the flesh. He gets hit with another wave, the lust of the eyes. He gets hit with another wave, the pride of life, when it is consecutive. Is there, I wonder if there's anybody in here that's been knocked down and tempted and hit. You get your breath from one thing and here another thing comes to knock you down. It's been consecutive back to back to back. I came to tell you for some of us, of us, it's just life circumstance. For others, you've got to learn to discern what it is. You are in a moment of warfare. 
You know it's warfare not only when it's consecutive, but you know it's warfare when it, number two, when it's consolidated. When it's not just one thing, but when you're dealing with leveling things, and any one of those things would level you, but you're dealing with three of them all at the same time. The confluence of all those things at the same time weighing on you. This time last year, one of the issues would have wiped you out. One of the issues would have had you frustrated. You woke up trying to figure out how you're dealing with three leveling issues at the same time as to disorient you and to render you helpless. You know that it's spiritual warfare often when it is can Consecutive, but also know it's spiritual warfare when it's consolidated. The Bible said as Nehemiah got close to closing the breaches in the wall, fulfilling God's purpose for his generation and for Israel, as he closed, began to close the wall, he was almost done with the assignment. The Bible said that he had adversaries, but when he did that, all three of the adversaries started to link up. The Bible says Sanballat, Tobiah, Geshem, they individually poked at him, but when he got ready to close up that wall and was focused on his purpose and about to get a breakthrough, all three of them at the same time linked up to work against him. You know that it's spiritual warfare when people that don't even like each other start teaming up together to drag you. You know when it's consolidated. It is not just one or the other. You can understand why Charlie would do that, but you can't figure out why Belinda would do that. You've been nice to Belinda. I understand Charlie's a hater, but now Charlie and Belinda, they don't even like each other. How are they tag teaming on me? Because when it's spiritual warfare, it is not not only can consecutive, but it is consolidated. I wonder if there's anybody in this place. I know there are because the Lord told me before I came. <laughs> Who are dealing with consolidated attack. But then you know a spiritual warfare when it's not just consolidated and consecutive, but when it's varied. Where the enemy changes up his stance on you. He was, he was, he was, he was left-handed, right-handed, but in the middle of the fight, he went southpaw on you. And just when you're trying to figure out one thing and you've mastered one challenge, you turn around and it's another challenge. You got to try to wrap your head around. Notice it was the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. He changed up his stance on Jesus to try to disorient them. You know that it's spiritual warfare when it's consecutive, consolidated, and varied. Um, but let me close with this. Because um, there is a timing Every good fighter, we gotta go, um, but understands timing. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, the pastor doesn't understand timing. I told you eight minutes, but it's been 11. But, but every good fighter, as we close, knows timing. Y you watch and can measure the stance and the timing of your opponent. So, now my son taught me this, he used to wrestle. He, so you know when to shoot your shot. You, you know how, how to defend against what's coming. If, if you understand the enemy's timing, you, it'll be easier for you to stand, God, I feel this, against the wiles, against the wild, against the schemes of the enemy. And there's some people who walked in here in spiritual warfare and didn't know you were in spiritual warfare. But the good news is you're not ignorant. You don't have to be ignorant as we watch the tape. We watch the enemy's film. We get to see his vulnerabilities just like he tries to capitalize on our vulnerabilities. And the truth is his vulnerability is timing. His timing leads me to a greater revelation. I told you that this happened um, right after Jesus was baptized. The heavens parted. The Bible says that in the form of a dove, 
the Holy Spirit came and rested on him. And the father said in an audible voice, this is my son. I always imagine it sound like James Earl Jones. This is my son <laughs> in whom I am well pleased. <laughs> Bible says he goes from there. He leaves a high point. When you're trying to figure out if it's spiritual warfare, observe the timing. It's often the enemy when you come out of a high moment in God where your identity is solidified, where your purpose is propelled, where you get a sense that you can be more and do more. It is always after you experience the glory of God that the enemy comes to steal the seed that was sown away from you or to frustrate the plans while they're still in incubation. That is why the moment he left from that high, the first thing the enemy does is says, if you're the son of God. He just said, this is my son. He comes right after a high. He comes right after a spiritual victory. He comes right after a clarifying moment. He comes right after your purpose is solidified. He comes after you believe you can do all things through Christ who has strengthened you. And so rather than getting discouraged, learn to time the enemy's shot. When you can time the enemy's shot, when you're coming off the mountain and know I just had a high in God, you celebrate that high, but you keep one eye up. Now I see what the Bible means when it says you got to watch and pray. I'm praying, I'm rejoicing, but I'm watching for the enemy because I one thing I know is after God takes me up, he's going to send somebody, some nasty in the, to try to pull me down back into the mud. But when I'm not ignorant of the enemy's schemes, because I've rolled that tape, I know after I come out of a confirming moment, I got to keep one eye open so that when he shoots his shot, I'm prepared to defend against it. Look at your neighbor, tell them, if you've been attacked after a high, it's probably warfare. We got to go though, but, but here's what I love about the time. Say time. It is not only when I'm coming off of a high, but I've been walking, God, I feel this, with God long enough to realize that the enemy does not only attack and it's spiritual warfare when I'm coming off of a high. But Jesus is here in the wilderness. And it says he was coming off of a high. Satan attempted to tempt him. But he does not only attack when we're coming off of a high, he attacks when we're getting ready to go into a high. The Bible says that he came into the wilderness led by the Spirit. But he came out of the wilderness in the power of the Spirit. And I've learned to time this. And here's the time. I've learned if I did not just come off of a high, and I'm going through the struggle of my life, I did not come off of a high, and I'm experiencing consecutive, consolidated, and varied attacks, I've learned not to cry, but I've learned to begin to celebrate. Why? Because generally speaking, pronounced spiritual warfare comes at certain times. It comes when I'm vulnerable. It comes when I'm weak. It comes when I'm frail. It also comes when I'm coming off of a high in God. But if I'm not coming off of a high with God, and I'm not in a position of vulnerability, and I'm experiencing pronounced warfare, usually it marks the fact that I'm getting ready to go into a time of elevation that I did not see coming. I gotta go for real, for real, y'all. But I came to declare to somebody, you've been experiencing pronounced spiritual warfare, and you have not come off a high, and if you have not come off a high, it's probably because you're getting ready to go into another place in God. And if you're in the middle of the battle right now, it is not because you're coming off of a high or you're not vulnerable. It could be because you're getting ready to go into something that God has for you. I've learned to celebrate. 
I've learned to shout in the middle of my battle. I've learned to stand in victory while the enemy's raging because either I'm coming off of a high and can identify him, but if not coming off a high, I'm getting ready to step into something that I'm unaware of. The Bible said, the Bible said that after he came out of the wilderness, he came out, listen, in the power of the Spirit. He went in led by the Spirit, but he came out in the power of the Spirit. It wasn't until then that he began to heal bodies. It wasn't until then that he began to raise the dead. It wasn't until then that he began to confound the wisdom of the wise. It wasn't until then that he gave power to his disciples. It wasn't until then that he gave, he gave hearing to the deaf. It wasn't until then that he spoke to the storms, the winds and the waves, and the winds of the waves obeyed him. You gotta learn to mark the moments as you review the tape as you advance the kingdom, you got to know if the enemy is raging in the manner in which I've described, chances are you're getting ready to step into another glory. Listen to me. I gotta pray with some people and we're not gonna be able to do a formal offering so put the information up on the screen. If you gotta go, you can give on your way. But there's some people that came into this place. There's some people that walked into here, didn't know what was going on. You've been disappointed because your, your challenges have come consecutively. They've come back to back. They've come in a consolidated fashion. It, it seems as if you've been cornered. It, they've come in a buried manner. It seems like the enemy's been changing up his strategy. But you walked in here today not only to receive sobriety, but you walked in here today for the power to be broken. And I don't know who I'm talking to, but I came for some people that have been in the middle of the battle and need to, to feel their strength again. You, you've been wrestling, but you need to move back into standing again. You, you've been in the struggle, but God is preparing you for victory. You just need enough to hold on until it gets here. I don't know who I'm talking to, but if that's you, I want you to stand to your feet right now. Stand to your feet right now. Stand to your feet. I want you to lift your hands. I want you to receive your confidence again. In the weeks to come, we may talk about the employing all that God has for you in this battle, in this struggle. But my, um, my assignment today was just to help you identify it. And the second thing was to stand with you in agreement that it'll be broken over your life. That every stronghold, every foothold, every open door, every person in a usable space, will come into alignment so that you can go into the purposes of God unhindered and unimpeded. For some of you, you felt like you've been drowning. You can't even catch your breath. And you've employed everything that you know to employ and nothing's moved. I'm going to speak this over us, and I'm expecting testimonies next week. I'm expecting things that were hidden to be revealed. I'm expecting things that have been misaligned to align. I'm expecting 
territory that the enemies occupied for him to be evicted. I'm expecting for this not to frustrate your mission, but for your mission to be accelerated. I'm, I'm expecting for every person that has hindered you, God, raising up 10 people that are there to help you. I'm, I'm expecting a new day. Lift your hands high. Father, we thank you. We praise you. And we glorify you in this house, declaring that there is no one like you, no one beside you anywhere. And now, Lord, we call on your great name. We call on your great name. And ask that you give us freedom to run. That you break every sabotaging cycle, every lie we've bought into, sown by the enemy. We pray that you quench every fiery dart, Father God. We pray for those who feel deflated that you inflate us, you breathe life into us, oh, the wind of your spirit. We ask for a fresh feeling of your Holy Spirit. We thank you, not even for plans that we entertain in our heart, but we thank you for the manifestation of, of the God dreams and the plans that we've carried in our heart. We thank you for overcoming every obstacle, every barrier, and every hindrance that has prevented us from accessing your best. Lord, teach us to stand against the schemes, against the wiles, and the attacks of the enemy, that you may be glorified. As we resist him, Lord, send him running running from our households, running from our assignment, running from our places of worship, running from our children's lives, running from his influence, from, from our families. Lord, break every stronghold and give us victory. Now, Lord, as we wait on it, we stand in victory. As we're believing you to do it, we're already declaring that it is done. And all those who agree with the prayer and believe what is just spoken over your life, let me hear you shout, amen, amen, amen. Somebody in this place, give God praise. Amen.